This week on Wealth Track, renowned financial historian and best selling author Neil Ferguson explains how understanding history can make you a better investor. Models will mislead you. Ultimately, you have to apply history and have a feel for how exactly the great events, big unexpected events like a pandemic, can change the game. An interview with Neil Ferguson is new this week on Consuelo Mack Wealth Track. Funding provided by Morgan Le Fay Dreams Foundation, Clearbridge Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, First Eagle Investment Management, and Strategus Asset Management. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. If there is one adjective we have heard repeatedly in the last year and a half, it is unprecedented. It has been applied to describe the amount of monetary and fiscal stimulus that's been poured into the economy. It's been used in relation to the pandemic lockdowns and reopenings and the record-breaking runs in stock, bonds, real estate, and commodity markets. Well, is there no historical precedent for these events? Who better to ask than Neil Ferguson? who has studied booms, busts, the rise and fall of empires, the power of societal networks and catastrophes of all sorts, including plagues and pandemics. Ferguson is one of the world's leading historians and an influential commentator on contemporary politics and economics. A senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University, and at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard, Ferguson is the author of numerous articles and a regular columnist for Bloomberg Opinion. The titles of some of his 16 books underscore his wide scope as an historian. Colossus, The Rise and Fall of the American Empire. The War of the World, 20th Century Conflict and the Descent of the West. The Ascent of Money, A Financial History of the World. The Square and the Tower, Networks and Power from the Freemasons to Facebook. Ferguson is also a television producer. His most recent PBS series, Neil Ferguson's Net World, is based on his bestseller, The Square and the Tower, about the power of networks through the centuries. He also won an International Emmy Award for his PBS documentary series based on the ascent of money. His most recent book is Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe, which analyzes how societies have reacted to crises from the Roman response to the eruption of Mount Vesuvius to various governments handling of COVID-19. He has also branched out into the investment arena. As founder and managing director of Green Mantle, a macroeconomic and geopolitical advisory firm offering historical perspective and research services to a select group of clients, including many top hedge funds and investment firms. According to Ferguson, experience has taught him that understanding history does help make us better investors. I began the interview by asking him why. When the financial crisis struck back in 2008, I was very struck by how few people in charge of major financial institutions had really any handle on the relevant history, which was, after all, the 1929 stock market crash. There was a real risk that we might plunge into a second Great Depression. And, uh, and very few people in positions of responsibility, a notable exception being Ben Bernanke, had actually studied the relevant financial history. So the people who were running the big institutions were essentially flying blind because they, they only had the history of their own personal experience. And I remember looking it up. Most of the CEOs of the big Wall Street firms had careers that had started in the early 1980s. So, so they hadn't even uh, personal first-hand memories of the great disruption of the 1970s. My observation was that financial history could in fact be of immense use to decision makers, both in the public and private sector. And I think actually Ben Bernanke bears that out. He made some crucial decisions in late 2008 based on the insight that we were running the risk of another Great Depression. And that was one reason why Fed policy was so aggressive so early. Not everybody on the FOMC agreed with him, but he was the chair, he could drive it through. And ever since then, I've tried to argue uh, to people on Wall Street and in other financial centers that you need to have financial history in your repertoire of tools. You can't just rely on some model. The model may work 90% of the time, but what about the 10% the of the time when things go nuts and, and something happens that you've never encountered before? So the idea behind Greenmantle was to try to apply history systematically to all the kind of big issues that asset managers and, and investors face. Some of those are, are macro questions. Uh, is there going to be an enormous contraction in the wake of a financial shock like Lehman Brothers? Some of them are political questions. Who's going to win the next election and what mm -hmm. will that mean? 
But in all the, these questions, there, there is a history that you can bring to bear uh, to answer it. And, and that's really been the, the approach I've taken for the last 10 years. Neil, what is the history that you brought to bear in uh, with the uh, the pr last presidential election, which which you did say would be messy and close? We all felt living through that period that there's never been anything like this. Well, we were clearly there were. So, what were the analogies? Well, a couple of uh, analogies came to mind. One was the election exactly a hundred years before. Uh, which happened after the great Spanish influenza pandemic. And that election was won handily uh, by the challenger, the Republican candidate at that time, uh, Warren Harding. And he campaigned on a normalcy ticket. He offered normalcy after the extraordinary events of the previous years under Woodrow Wilson, which of course included not only a pandemic, but also a world war. And, uh, and that normalcy uh, uh, slogan was tremendously effective. I saw Joe Biden as a normalcy candidate uh, uh, running against somebody who had brought a wrecking ball to Washington. And I certainly felt that the, uh, the pandemic greatly reduced Trump's chances of re-election, particularly with elderly voters who'd really been, who'd been crucial uh, in key swing states four years before. So that was one of the historical analogies mm -hmm. that, that we thought about. And of course, the last thing that you always have to ask yourself when, when you think an election is going to be close uh, is will this be Truman v. Dewey? In other words, are, are you going to actually find a massive upset that catches the media by surprise? I thought a lot about that, but came to the conclusion in the end that when you thought about it long and hard, Trump was going to lose. It wasn't going to be a landslide in favor of the Democrats. Uh, it was going to be close and it was going to be messy precisely because, as in 2000, there would be at least one state, and it turned out there were more than one state, where the issue could be, the result could be, could be challenged. So I, I felt that using that historical approach got to a much better projection than political scientists were coming up with using polling and, and models. I, I talked to some very eminent political scientists and pollsters in the period prior to the election, and they were predicting much, much larger electoral college majorities for Joe Biden. And I think that's because models will mislead you. Ultimately, you have to apply history and have a feel for how exactly the great events, big unexpected events like a pandemic can change the game. So when you're talking to Green Mantle clients, what were the investment ramifications? What did you advise they do on, you know, based on that outcome? Well, let me take you back to the beginning of 2020 first, because before we got to the election in November, we had to navigate a pandemic. Right. Uh, one of the things that I think really uh, helped was having a feel for how pandemics begin. Uh, back in January of 2020, uh, from a pretty early stage, week three maybe of that month, I was convinced there was going to be a global pandemic. And right. I can remember telling uh, clients, uh, this is going to be big. It's going to be certainly comparable with some of the big influenza pandemics of the 20th century. Uh, and you should expect it to be global, highly disruptive, beginning with supply chains out of China. And therefore, brace yourself for some really major uh, financial as well as macro disruption. And again, that was a big call, Neil, back then. A because huge that was call. way before other people realized that, that how serious this could be. And I might add in my introduction to you, I mentioned your most recent book, you know, Doom, the politics of catastrophe. And so this very much plays in of, of you are well equipped to analyze this. Well, I, th I think that if, if you've studied uh, history, you run into plagues, it's kind of hard to miss them because they're <laughs> the big disruptive events, whether you're a medievalist looking at the 14th century Black Death, or in my case, someone who'd worked a lot on the 1918-19 influenza. And right. the, the red flags were there from very early on that something bad was happening. Uh, especially when the Chinese government denied that there was human to human transmission, which was just the kind of thing that made me think it almost certainly was going on. But I think back to that time when I first started to argue that, that we were facing a global pandemic, the clients were overwhelmingly skeptical, as were people at the World Economic Forum in Davos who wanted to talk about climate change, climate because change. of course, climate change is always the the uh, top of the agenda. And that was at a time when the pandemic was already underway and planes were flying from Wuhan to European and American destinations. It really took a while to persuade people that this 
was going to happen and happen globally. Even in February, I can remember having very heated conversations with people who thought it would be contained in China or that it certainly wouldn't be more than the seasonal influenza in the United States. Again, history helps because it tells you that in the early phase of a pandemic, it doesn't look like exponential growth because the case numbers initially are relatively small. And at first it looks like it's linear, but that's exactly what it looks like at the beginning of a pandemic. The beginning of a pandemic is a time when there are little tiny red flags and you have to look a bit closely to see them. But the pattern uh, was similar also to 1957, which also began as so many pandemics have begun in China. Uh, and initially looked uh, like it was a, a Chinese problem and became global very rapidly. Uh, and of course, we now are far more reliant on air travel than sea travel. So it was easy to predict that it would go really quickly global uh, if it was as contagious as I suspected it was. And again, so to, to bring that to, to, the, to the real world investment decisions, then what were the investment decisions that one would make that you would talk about with your clients uh, in, in expectation that this pandemic would be a very serious event. Well, you had to get very defensive uh, because, yeah. of course, it was inevitable that with all the disruption of production and supply chains, there would be a financial uh, crisis of some sort. And in March, it struck and it was very severe. It extended right into even the, uh, the U.S. Treasury market briefly. Uh, so there were uh, two things to say. Number one, you have to be ready and very defensive for this shock because at some point everybody's going to wake up to the mm -hmm. reality. And the second thing, of course, was well, what will the authorities do under these conditions? And again, I think it was important to realize that if you were sitting at the Fed or at the Treasury, this may not have been a financial crisis, but it looked a lot like one by March. And so it wasn't difficult to predict that there would be very quickly quantitative easing, infinity, a big expansion of the Fed balance sheet, as well, of course, as a great deal of of spending, the CARES Act, which was very hastily improvised. So my sense was that there would be this temporary, very sharp shock of panic when people realized that this really was a global pandemic. And then a great fire hose of fiscal and monetary support would be turned on, rather as had been done in 2008, 2009, only on an even larger scale, because many people from that period had concluded we didn't do enough. Uh, so that mm -hmm. was, again, a, a, a matter of applying history and trying to figure out uh, how sustained that reflation would be. And it's not difficult uh, when the Fed is, is signaling zero rates as far as the eye can see to uh, anticipate rapid appreciation of financial assets. There were a few tricky questions like, was gold a better bet than Bitcoin uh, when things really were ugly? That wasn't an immediately easy question to answer. But the but broad was outlook the was clear. Well, the answer <laughs> was that Bitcoin was a much better bet than gold. Uh -huh. uh, that wasn't immediately obvious. At first, they actually behaved rather similarly. I mean, everything sold off at that moment in March, uh, but Bitcoin took off and gold did not in the rest of 2020. And so if you believed, as I do, that, that Bitcoin is a, a kind of digital gold or maybe technically an option on digital gold, uh, it was actually a better thing uh, to, to hold in your portfolio than gold over 2020 as a whole. That is such a radical idea. It, it's not radical in certain circles, but honestly, the, the digital gold um, idea, I've certainly heard that before. There are a lot of skeptics out there about that. Matt McLennan being one of them at First Eagle, who is a friend of yours. Let's go to, uh, to digital currency. And again, are, are there historical an analogies to that? And, and what's, your, you know, what's your take and understanding of where digital currencies are going, what they represent. Well, first, Consuelo, credit where it's due. Uh, one of the beauties of Greenmantle is that I get to have conversations with people like Matt McLennan. And it was actually in conversation with him that the idea of an option on digital gold came up because I've been asking, is this digital gold? And, and Matt said, think of it as an option on digital gold and it'll behave much more like an option. This was a brilliant insight. Uh -huh. And I remember incorporating it uh, into a new edition of my book, The Ascent of Money, back in 2018. So the, the, the question of what is Bitcoin or what is cryptocurrency has been around now uh, since the financial crisis. Let, let's not forget the original paper uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, explained Bitcoin, the Satoshi paper, was published in 2008, the same year that Lehman blew up. And my right. initial response, I, I remember, was a kind of fuddy-duddy, old uh, professor type 
response. This is uh, not a credible challenge to existing payment systems. Don't even uh, talk to me about this as, as money. And that was my response to my teenage son, uh, another person whose uh, opinion I greatly respect. Uh, but by the time we got to 2017, and he'd been nagging me for some years about it, I, I had to rethink my view. And I rethought it in a couple of ways. First, it's, it's probably a mistake to think of Bitcoin as money. At least it might become money, but it's not money yet. But what it certainly can be uh, is a kind of digital asset. Uh, right. And the same was true of Ethereum and other uh, digital currencies that, that were being uh, uh, added to the ecosystem at that time. Uh, if you look back in history and asked, what is this like? Which is always my question. What's this like? Mm -hmm. It was a bit like the early days of equity finance. In, in 2017, people were using initial coin offerings, kind of the way the early equity uh, issuers were, were using uh, stocks to raise money in ways that were novel and quick and uh, not encumbered with regulation. So my first take on crypto was, this is just a kind of new way of raising money. And in that sense, it's like the experiments with the early uh, equity companies uh, that produced the bubbles, the famous Mississippi and South Sea bubbles. So it was obvious, A, that you were going to get bubbles, because that's kind of part of financial innovation, but B, that something would survive when the bubble burst. And my guess was that although there would be this bust, that Bitcoin and other uh, tokens, particularly uh, Ethereum, would survive. And it would be a mistake to expect them to go to zero. Now, some, uh, including some friends of mine, some people argued, it's all going to zero. Uh, Bitcoin right. is expletive coin. I thought that was wrong. And my sense was that financial history tells you it's an evolutionary process. There are a lot of things that go extinct, but innovation ultimately will produce some survivors. And those survivors will then become really very important. So we saw that in 2020 in a moment of total panic when it seemed as if not only the financial system, but pot potentially uh, the international trading system would break down in the pandemic. A great many people, especially in countries with somewhat rickety uh, banking systems, turn to crypto. And this adoption process where people say, look, I, I, I should have at least some uh, percentage of my, of my portfolio in this, even if it's only 0.2%. My prediction in 2018 was that adoption process will drive the Bitcoin price up. If it's 0.2% of the portfolio of every millionaire in the world, then you're on $15,000 of Bitcoin. And if it's 1%, then it's 75,000. And that gives you a range, I think, of, of right. roughly where, where things have gone in the past year. You know, back to the election, you, you figured out uh, as far as Trump's losing a close, messy election, that Joe Biden was the normalcy kind of candidate. And then, then we had, you know, then we had the other wrinkle, which was the Georgia runoffs. So explain what a turning point that election has been and its significance, and again, the, the investment ramifications. Well, this was one of those occasions when you have to kind of bet against history, because history said that the Democrats probably wouldn't win both. Uh, but there was something very exceptional going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and an enormous uh, amount of firepower was directed at those uh, campaigns by the Democratic Party. And it, right. it became clear that the stakes were high, very high, because on, on these runoffs depended whether or not they would have a majority in the Senate. Remember, as I said, the election was close. The Democrats won the presidency, not by a huge margin, enough to be contested. They did not do well in their Senate and House races. And so mm -hmm. there they were, everything hinging on two runoffs in Georgia. And, uh, and for that reason, I think they were able to mobilize uh, votes uh, uh, and devote resources in a way that, that beat the historic track record and produced those, those victories. Now, the consequences for investors were colossal because at that moment, when those results came in, the Democrats had, with uh, Vice President Harris's casting vote, the majority in the Senate, and that meant that Mitch McConnell was no longer the most powerful man in Washington, mm -hmm. uh, that the Senate was going to start uh, at least voting through some uh, of the Biden administration's agenda. And as that agenda emerged as really a very bold, big spending agenda, right. tackling not only COVID relief, but also infrastructure and a bunch of other things, it, it mattered enormously from, from the point of view of fiscal policy that the Democrats could actually do this and they weren't going to be thwarted uh, 
uh, in the Senate. I think if you take a step back and ask, what is the big question for investors now mm -hmm. uh, in, in mid-2021? It's got to be, is inflation coming? Have they overshot? And are they doing too much fiscal on the back of an economy that is already recovering rapidly, thanks primarily to vaccination? This was a question Larry Summers posed back in February. It didn't right. make him very popular with his friends in the Democratic Party, but it was the right question to ask because clearly this is a very, very large fiscal package. Total price tag in the initial proposals close to $6 trillion when the output gap is nothing like the one that we confronted after the uh, financial crisis. So the big question, and here I think history is extremely helpful, is mm -hmm. how are we heading, not just for transitory inflation, which the Fed admits is gonna happen, but for an actual uncoupling of inflation expectations and a new uh, uh, inflation trajectory, right. unlike anything we've seen in, in decades. And that's, that's the kind of question that I don't think an economic model can tell you uh, you need to think historically to try and get the answer. So where did you look or where are you looking historically and, and what's the answer? <laughs> well, I, I remember kicking around a couple of possible analogies. One was the way the U.S. economy behaved uh, after World War II uh, when controls, of which there had been a great many, were taken off. Right. And you had a, a real surge of inflation. But I came to the conclusion that a better analogy was with the 1960s. And and maybe that's appropriate because I've heard it often said uh, by his supporters that Joe Biden is a transformative president like Lyndon Johnson. Well, mm -hmm. certainly if you look at what happened under Johnson's presidency, uh, he inherited an inflation rate below 2%. It had been pretty flat in the first uh, years of the 60s. And then in two big jumps, inflation went to 3% to 6% by the end of, of the Johnson presidency. And that happened uh, because... Uh, Fiscal policy was stimulative, uh, Great Society plus Vietnam, and monetary policy under the Fed was too accommodative. And, and most people who've studied this uh, would agree that the, the mistakes were made uh, in the late 60s that led to the big inflation of the 1970s. I think that's the worry that you have to have if you're at right. the Fed. Alan Meltzer wrote this great history of the Fed, the late great Alan Meltzer. If Alan were here today, he'd be saying they're making the same mistakes they made in the 60s, but on a much larger scale. Because remember, the deficits and the balance sheet expansion of the late 60s is much, much less. They're both much less than we've seen uh, in, in, the past, uh, in the past year. So I think there's a significant chance uh, that you're going to get a rerun of that 1960s shift in inflation expectations, which then, of course, went even further in the 1970s when the, uh, when the oil price shock struck in 1973. And there's another historical analogy there that I think is important and worth thinking about. We talk all the time about green infrastructure, green new deals, mm -hmm. Europe, America, most countries have bold ambitions to be carbon neutral at some stage in the coming decades. That is not a free lunch, contrary to what some people are claiming. I think that will impose significant costs when you actually work out what it means to transition away from things like shale gas to transition to so-called renewables, that is going to have a cost. Maybe not as drastic as the oil price hikes of 73 and 79, but it is going to have an impact. And I could conceive of ways in which it actually uh, could reinforce that existing inflation impulse. So what you've got, it seems to me, is that the initial impulse comes from fiscal and monetary policy. It's the Fed that just delays a little bit too long in tightening. And then you have some supply side factors like this energy transition that actually further reinforce the inflation tendency. Am I certain about this? No. Nobody can have total certainty about where this goes. But is that an appropriate historical analogy to consider? Right. I think it is. Neil Ferguson, always a treat to have you on Wealth Track. It's been too long. And I look forward to talking to you again about your whatever your next project is in your next book. Thanks, Consuelo. At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is read Neil Ferguson's latest book, Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe. A particularly important read for current times, Ferguson discusses how disasters, earthquakes, wildfires, financial crises, wars, and yes, pandemics are inherently hard to predict.
He argues that historical perspective shows we are getting worse, not better, at handling these crises. The New York Times book review characterized doom as insightful, productively provocative, and downright brilliant, which promises to make a contribution to improving our management of future disasters. It certainly expands our, the reader's understanding of them and puts COVID-19 and the various ways it was handled around the world into perspective. Let's hope our response as a nation to the next inevitable crisis won't turn it into a catastrophe. Well, next week in part two of our wide ranging interview with Neil Ferguson, we explore protecting ourselves against crisis risk, whether natural disasters or man-made. In this week's extra feature, Ferguson shares his reasons for branching out into the investment world with his advisory firm, Green Mantle, and the exciting opportunities it is presenting. For those of you active on social media, thank you for following us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. And thank you for watching and listening to us today. Have a super weekend and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one.